it was interesting about how I, I got my first start with my first program. Um, when I got elected, I went to the sheriff, who's a good friend of mine. We actually got elected together. And I said, DT, I said, the first program that I'm going to implement is going to be one that you and I are going to do together. And we're not going to say one word to anybody because the two things that you always hear in state government are we don't have money and it won't work. I said, so we're not going to say one word until we get this program going. And the first program I did was my trash pickup program. Every Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, um, my people that have been assigned to trash detail meet me right there at the jail. Um, and they pick up trash from 8 to noon. And we've got different people on trash. I've got people that are out there till they get a job. I've got people that are out there for hours for their community service. And I've got some of my drug court folks, when they get sanctioned, they might have to pick up trash. So the very first Saturday that we did it, the sheriff's like, what are we doing? I said, just have a van. I said, we're going out to, to pick up trash. So I think we had like five people our first Saturday. And from there, it just kept building and building. And we still do that program. And I'm out here every Saturday, take and roll, making sure that they've gotten jobs or you know what kind of hours they've done. And Trash has done three things. One, it makes them get up and be somewhere on Saturday morning which kills a lot of folks because they don't like getting up on a Saturday morning and they certainly don't want to be somewhere at 8 in the morning. Second, the county loves it because people call in and say, hey, we need trash picked up on Seawolves Road or we need trash picked up on Ryan Road. So it's been a good outreach for them. And third, I make a big deal out of the trash program so that when they finish, they feel like, hey, I've accomplished something, this is a good thing to do. And DT and I started that, and nobody knew we were doing it for six months. Anyway, someone one day asked the sheriff, who are these people on the side of the road? And he said, well, that's Judge McCooey's trash program. And he said, what's Judge McCooey's trash program? And he said, well, that's a program that, that Judge McCooey started. And this happened to be one of the county engineers, and he said, hey, Sheriff, would you like us to pick up the bags after y'all pick up the trash? And he said, yeah, that'd be great. And then DT and I went to the county, and I told the county what I was doing, the county commission, and I said, hey, guys and girls, the sheriff's been so kind to provide me as deputies to help us, so y'all need to start paying the overtime and helping the sheriff with his funding, which they did. And so now it's been a very good program, but that was my first program that I started when I got here. And again, it was just funny because I told the sheriff, do not say a word until we get this thing going and it's working. And now everybody knows about it and they like it. The, that was, the trash program was the first program. The second program I did was my victim offender conferencing program. Um, I knew that was going to be controversial when people heard about what do you mean a defendant's going to sit and talk with the victim and what kind of voodoo is this Judge McCooey. So what I did, um, I knew I had to get people down here to train our folks first and so I contacted the experts in Minnesota and I got Carolyn McLeod who is wonderful. I got a grant, first of all, that I applied for, and I got her to come down here, and she spent four days training a group of volunteers that I'd gotten, and we had um, Air Force officers from the base, we had ministers, we had housewives, we had lawyers, we had all kinds of people that went through that first four-day training session. And a lot of people are just very, you know, skeptical, just what is this that we're doing? And I remember the DA, who I used to work for, um, said, well, what kind of cases are we going to do victim offender conferencing for, Judge McCooey? And I said, well, we're going to do every kind of case. And she said, what do you mean we're going to do every kind of case? And I said, I don't care if it's a murder or a theft. I said, 
if a victim and a defendant want to sit down and meet together, we're going to do the case. Well, that almost sent her through the roof. She said, we can do thefts and maybe, you know, criminal possession of forged instrument, those kind of cases, but we're not doing serious cases. And I said, well, Ellen, I said, the great thing about being a judge is I can do whatever I want in my courtroom. And I said, we're going to do every kind of case that there is. And she just kind of looked at me and, and went about her way. And I thought that she thought, well, she's not really serious about that. But I was very serious. In fact, the second case we did was a murder case. And that meeting lasted all day on a Saturday in the jail because the defendant was still locked up and the victim met with the defendant in the jail after they'd done you know the pre-conference with the victim and the defendant and I think the defendant wanted his mom there and the victim had one of her children with her and the two facilitators for that it lasted literally all day in that jail and I will never forget that case because there were three other defendants and her son had been murdered shot 16 times it was gang related drug killing and the other three ended up going to trial and I remember after that last trial of the last defendant that mom came up to me and she said Judge McCooey can I talk to you and I said sure and she said, I just wanted to tell you thank you for letting me meet with the defendant, the first one. I don't think I could have sat through these three trials if it hadn't been for that meeting. She said, I very much had a peace within myself, and it was thanks to that meeting. And I thought, that's what it's all about right there. And it was so important for her um, and from there, Victim of Fitter Conferencing continues to grow. But I will be honest with you, I have never, I'm going to knock on wood as I say this, I have never gotten bad press on the program in Montgomery. And the reason being, it's how you explain it to people. And when you tell people it's voluntary, nobody has to do it. And I say, does every victim want to sit down and talk to their defendant? Of course not. Does every defendant want to sit and talk to their victim? Of course not. But do we need to offer it to the folks who need to? Yes. And I tell them, I say, if you go out of here today and someone broke in your car and took your radio, you might be annoyed and you're going to have to call the insurance company and, you know, file a report. But the odds of you wanting to meet that person Probably not, but if you go home tonight and someone's murdered your entire family, are you going to have questions? Are there all kinds of things going through your mind? Shoot, yeah. The worse something happens to you, the more you hurt, the more you need to talk to that person. And only the person who did that wrong can answer those questions. And as hard as that is for us to hear and think about those things, it's very much needed for that victim. And so people understand that, and it's when you explain it to folks. So when I first started Victim Offender Conferencing, that was in 1999, it wasn't really known, and it sounded a little voodoo and out there. Now, when you say restorative justice, it's kind of like a buzzword, which can be a bad thing because you could abuse it, which is scary to me. I, you know, people have to do it correctly. But now it's a lot more acceptable. But when I started it, it was not acceptable at all. But I've never gotten bad press on it because I think it's how you explain it to folks.